Welcome to Troutman Pepper's podcast on the hydrogen industry's present and future. My name is Gregory Len, and I am a partner in the intellectual property group based in the Boston office of Troutman Pepper. With me today are Daniel Archuleta, also from Troutman, and Wes Hansen from Ivis Energy Solutions. As I mentioned, I am part of the intellectual property group here at Troutman, and in that role, I'm able to leverage my master's degree in mechanical engineering, as well as my years of experience working as an engineer at a clean tech hydrogen company to advise and guide our clients through the IP litigation process. Daniel leads the firm's natural gas pipeline practice, where he advises a broad array of clients on regulation, competition, and transactional issues. His extensive industry experience and engineering background enable him to understand the real-time logistical and operational problems his clients face. Daniel leverages his unique skill set to tackle emerging issues and navigate complex matters for his clients. But more broadly, Troutman's energy lawyers have consulted, have counseled and consulted utilities and other energy clients regarding the changing regulatory challenges since the 1920s. We are recognized as a national top tier energy practice, providing industry leadership and outstanding advice that maximizes client value within the applicable federal and state regulatory frameworks. We will flash the Troutman Energy Law Insights web link on the screen if you'd like to find out more about our group. I'll turn it over to you, Dan. Thank you so much for that intro, Greg, and wonderful to be here. Um, I think that leaves me with the distinct pleasure of introducing our third and probably most valuable contributor for today, uh, Wes Hansen. Wes has over 22 years of experience in both the hydrogen and alternative energy field, both from a technical and theoretical research perspective, as well as product design, hands-on commercial space as well. Currently, Wes is the Director of Business Development at Ivis Energy Solutions. Among other products, Ivis has developed an integrated on-site hydrogen generation, compression, and dispensing system using water and electricity to produce high purity fuel cell grade hydrogen. Wes specifically has led the design, sale, and installation of roughly 25 hydrogen systems during his career. Wes, wonderful to have you on the program today. What else are we missing at the outset that you would like to share with us, both in terms of your experience and Ivis particularly? Well, thank you, Jess. I appreciate that. Uh, makes me feel uh, important. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say, um, you know, so let's let's talk about Ivis Energy Solutions a little bit here and the things that we work on. Um, you know, so we're we have a strong focus in the hydrogen space, hydrogen refueling stations. You mentioned what we call a simple fuel which is an all-in-one um, hydrogen fueling station for either uh, 350 bar or 700 bar fueling, um, electrolyzer based. Um, currently the offerings are uh, a 20 kilogram a day, small box, but we also do larger hydrogen stations that are either, uh, as, as I said, 350 bar fueling for buses or 700 bar fueling for passenger vehicles. Uh, 700 bar fueling for trucks. Um, you know, those are uh, larger dispense um, quantities there. Uh, but we also are involved in the electrical, the electric vehicle charging space. So we have, um, you know, a proprietary access to um, uh, DC fast chargers. So level three chargers uh, that can go up to 360 uh, kilowatt size. Um, you know, most of our customers are um, fleet-based or municipalities, uh, you know, looking for mixed fleet. We, we, we like to think of ourselves as the and solution rather than, you know, hydrogen or electric. Um, but Ivis Incorporated is a, a larger uh, organization. Um, again, I'm part of Ivis Energy, which is uh, mostly the hydrogen and vehicle charging. Uh, we call it e-mobility. Uh, but Ivis Incorporated, we also have uh, Ivis Absorption in Canada, which is, um, you know, just outside Montreal and has a, a lot of, uh, works quite a bit in the space of uh, hydrogen purification. So PSA is uh, pressure swing absorber restart for those who aren't familiar and biogas upgrading uh, as well. So we, we, we reach in, in, in actually Ivis Energy and Ivis Absorption, we, we work very closely together on projects. Um, where there's maybe it's a pipeline gas that needs 
to be upgraded to SAE quality hydrogen and then um, converted to uh, fueling pressures for 350 or 700 bar uh, vehicles. Thank you very much for the for that uh, background, Wes. Um, so with introductions in hand, and I think uh, part of what you covered in your background, as well as what Ivis specializes in, leads to a, a perfect segue for today's podcast, which at a high level is to talk about hydrogen, um, all the excitement surrounding hydrogen, um, but you know, leveraging Wes's very real hands-on experience, some of the issues um, that all companies might want to consider in the hydrogen space, uh, given the vast potential it holds, as well as future projections for increased uh, production and, and demand. Um, so building off of uh, a couple of the items you touched on, um, heard you talk plenty about uh, hydrogen, but also about renewables in general, as well as natural gas. Um, if we look at the energy industry um, from a global perspective, right, we've really seen a big boom over several decades, and in the U.S. in particular, um, in the renewable space in terms of carbon reductions. So if we're painting a very large and broad uh, brushstroke, maybe the 1990s is when we saw uh, wind really take off and, and hold um, vast growth and development within the U.S., solar um, start to really ramp up in the 2000s, and then the 2010s, the emergence of, of batteries, um, which then might lead us to the 2020s as the launching point, perhaps, for the next major development on the frontier of the energy transition, that being hydrogen. Um, from a high level, presently, there are immense benefits um, to developing and expanding on hydrogen use. Um, probably the biggest belt benefit in particular is to help use hydrogen to offset or fill the role of traditional uses of fossil fuels um, with zero emissions in the process. Um, that then leads to reduce emissions, both from a climate change and overall air quality perspective that helps provide from um, some extra energy security, which is always an important issue. And we've seen that come up in particular um, recently in the last coming years and, and going forward with the ongoing conflict in, in Ukraine. And then the fact that hydrogen can help integrate variable resources, renewable energy in particular on the electric grid, acting as a long-term storage solution and option for electricity where there is abundant or surplus electricity can be stored, uh, potentially using newly developed or existing storage caverns or storage facilities, and then utilize when and where it is most valuable. I should note up front that hydrogen is in fact used in large quantities in specific locations already. Um, most of that use comes from refining chemical and other end use manufacturing and industrial uses, um, primarily produced uh, utilizing fossil fuels and accounting for roughly 6% of global natural gas use and 2% of, of coal. So scaling up that use to increase the amount of hydrogen produced, particularly um, in a lower carbon fashion or from renewables in particular, will be critical to bring down costs of technologies um, for production um, and using clean hydrogen. Uh, such as electro electrolyzers, um, fuel cells, and hydrogen production with carbon capture and storage. Sure. Um, going forward, um, we, we will see hydrogen-based fuels um, increasing in terms of projected growth. Um, and in, uh, for instance, any net zero emissions um, projection model uh, could increase to 60 gigatons or um, in CO2 emissions uh, between the time period of 2021 and 2050. Um, that's a pretty aggressive projection, but vast amounts of, of reductions and growth um, from hydrogen. And then I will note um, the International Energy Agency, or IEA, and the International Renewable Energy Agency, or IRENA. Um, thank you for staying with me through those uh, abbreviations. Um, expect hydrogen to meet 12 to 13% of energy demand by 2050, 
up from virtually zero uh, use today. Um, with those projections, with that growth, I think we've seen uh, countries also um, put out projections and adopt hydrogen as a growth strategy in the last five years alone. Uh, roughly 30 or more countries have developed or started uh, national hydrogen strategies. Um, for instance, Japan uh, recently uh, updated their hydrogen strategy, which now is looking to supply 12 million tons of hydrogen by 24, 2040. Excuse me. Um, nevertheless, despite all of its promise, the pathway for clean hydrogen in particular remains uncertain. Um, thus, uh, the, the value uh, West brings to the table today. Um, two primary fault lines um, have emerged, how to produce hydrogen, which I've already alluded to, and then which sectors to deploy it um, for large scale end use purposes. On the production side, I think the, the dominant projections are to have clean hydrogen coming from green hydrogen, um, which is produced using renewable electricity, and blue hydrogen from natural gas equipped with carbon capture technologies. Um, and then in terms of consumption, consumption, hydrogen might not always be the best tool for the job. Um, for example, hydrogen combustion might be less efficient um, based on the circumstances, based on the intended use than direct electrification for cars. So with that big wind up setting the stage for today, whole lot of promise, but a whole lot of uncertainties involved as well. Um, and let me kick it over to Greg uh, to start to tee this up and, and talk about uh, some of the next steps uh, within the hydrogen space. Thanks, Daniel. <clears throat> so with that as the backdrop, let's turn to Wes now, our, our resident expert in the hydrogen industry, to help us sort through some of these issues and expand on where hydrogen may go in the near and the long term. And I think we want to emphasize some of the most important considerations that various companies should keep in mind for their future hydrogen products since Wes has really been there in the field over the past two decades uh, in first person dealing with them. So I think, Wes, to start that off, um, in terms of you talked about a little bit at the beginning of where IVIS is now, has in terms of the part of the hydrogen industry or the value chain of hydrogen, uh, can you talk a little bit about where IVIS focuses now and if its focus has shifted at all over time as the market has changed? Let's, uh, I'll take it in two parts there. So IVIS, uh, well, let me talk about hydrogen where it's used today a little bit. Uh, okay. That'll help because hydrogen right now is used a lot in refineries and you'll see very large scale hydrogen production facilities um, that utilize natural gas, steam methane reforming. Um, I've got about 20 years background in, in steam reforming, uh, small scale, but, but you know, the, the chemistry is the same. Um, and, and that hydrogen is is used to, as uh, as Dan was saying, to um, to synthesize whether it's uh, oils, waxes, or you know other other um, components. But um, you know th that's generally where a lot of the hydrogen from the industrial gas companies come has been coming from. There's a lot of focus on green hydrogen and wanting it to come from a carbon neutral or you know net carbon zero source. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of that coming. From electrolyzers um, and, and as Dan said, you know, green electricity, whether it's coming from hydro up in Hydro Quebec, um, you know, that is in either liquefied and transported or compressed in the tube trailers or put into pipelines. So that's um, it's it's been a growing industry for sure, and our our uh, up to now our focus has been really helping municipalities reach out to underprivileged communities that need to improve their air quality. So it could be, you know, bus fleets um, in urban districts. Um, you know, we build uh, hydrogen refueling stations where we take either an electrolyzer source of gas, and that electrolyzer could be powered by a solar array, or, you know, could be coming from the grid, um, or we can take tube trailer gas, or we can take, um, liquefied hydrogen, um, which is compressed through cryogenic pumps and vaporized for um, fueling into, into vehicles. Um, so that's, that's kind of our background. The, you know, we do hydrogen stations is kind of the, the long and short of it. And the, the vehicle uh, charging portion of that 
is uh, when communities want to take that next step to be able to offer a grid resiliency, we can do vehicle to grid. So you have this battery vehicle that's charged up um, wherever that electricity comes from. In the event of a natural disaster, you want to be able to use those vehicles to you know, operate uh, the town's uh, water pump system or something at the water tower or, um, or take those buses and, and park them at a hospital, power hospital. So, so that's kind of our approaches and is, um, is really community focus. Uh, but we're, we're certainly involved in a lot of these discussions of hydrogen hubs. Um, you know, we're, we're contributing from a technical perspective as to how these sorts of things, ha these sorts of things should happen. Um, when do you need to, we, you know, what are those inflection points for compression, uh, compressed gas, compressed gas distribution, and then higher pressure trailers, um, or liquefaction. So th did that answer your question? Maybe. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a couple of great points I want to circle back on. Uh, first, <clears throat> what are some of the kind of efficient characteristics or chemical, unique chemical characteristics about hydrogen? You mentioned you're helping municipalities improve air quality. And how does, for the layperson, how does hydrogen help achieve that? I think uh, that's a great question. So let's, um, let's take an energy pathway. And I like to think of our kind of the boundaries of our energy pathways as this little marble that we live on floating in space. Um, so well to wheel is the term that we used many, many years ago. Um, where does the energy come from and how does it get to what we're using it for? Um, so if you, let's say you're going to use a fossil fuel like natural gas to generate that hydrogen and then put it into a fuel cell vehicle, whether it's a truck or a car, um, you're going to be looking at a net reduction in CO2 emissions. And the reason is because the efficiency of using a hydrogen fuel cell is greater than that of using an internal combustion engine. So even though you have an extra step, you know, you're pulling the, that fossil fuel out of the ground and you need to convert it to hydrogen, um, you know, there's equipment involved, but the net efficiency of the, you know, the end use is greater than what, um, you know, making a bunch of explosions every uh, couple of seconds um, to drive a wheel down the road. You can use an electric motor, which is very efficient. Um, so that's kind of, that, that's where we are. Um, and can you, sorry, yeah. Rob, you talked about the efficiency side. Can you also talk about the chemical reaction emission side? What happens when you put hydrogen and oxygen into a yeah, fuel? What sure, comes sure. out? Thank you. Yeah. So the way that a fuel cell works basically is a membrane, um, not so dissimilar from the cellophane that you have to wrap your food up in the refrigerator. Um, but it's chemically treated to, uh, to react hydrogen on one side in the air, oxygen on the other, and the byproduct that's formed is water um, and some waste heat. So it's not 100% efficient, it's about 60% um, from the chemical energy coming in from the hydrogen um, is utilized to generate electricity, which can be used in a hybrid electric system to drive a vehicle down the road. And, and do you consider uh, hydrogen an energy source or an energy carrier? No, uh, definitely an energy carrier. I mean, I've worked with uh, some folks. Uh, I don't know if it's it's just to say I didn't coin this term, but um, hydrogen um, is an electron carrier. Basically, the proton of hydrogen carries that electron, and hydrogen offers the ability to have the convenience of a fuel with the benefits of an electric drivetrain by using that electron that's carried with it. Um, to power vehicles. And, and you mentioned that you're seeing increased interest not only from municipalities, but from larger scale uh, national programs such as the DOE's uh, hydrogen hub programs. Are you, are you seeing it, um, the interest more from a local displacement in emissions or more in, an in, in a view of we have a lot of renewable excess energy and maybe storing it in batteries or pumping up water uphill isn't always the answer, maybe hydrogen storage is the answer. Where are you seeing the, the greatest market needs from? Uh, well, both, um, but the greatest market needs are really, uh, I think coming from uh, municipalities. I mean, there's mandates right now um, that say, you know, your fleet or your, your, you know, your transit has to be zero emission by 2040, develop your pathway to get there. And some vehicles that make sense, uh, let's take buses, for example, 
it makes sense to use an electric bus where you charge, um, you know, overnight while the buses are sitting there. Um, some buses, electric buses, they run into range issues, so they need non route charging. And then, um, you know, in some climates where it's cold or it's very hilly, those electric, all electric buses, battery electric buses, uh, run into some challenges and, um, that's where a hydrogen fuel cell really, you know, uh, starts to shine because it doesn't see a temperature uh, performance, um, diminishment from temperature. Um, you know, it gives you that power as long as you give it fuel. And again, um, refueling a, a bus with the proper station could be 12 to 18 minutes where charging that bus might take much, much longer. Again, it depends on a lot of things like the size of the chargers and, and the, the type of batteries that are on board. But, um, but that's where, you know, uh, having a mixed fleet is important. Um, uh, you know, you might have some shorter route inner city buses that could be all electric, but the ones that have to run the outer loop um, really benefit from a hybrid, uh, uh, you know, uh, energy pathway. And before I turn it back over for, to Daniel for his view kind of on the future, one last question for thinking back on my notes here, uh, for the layperson, can you explain to the layperson what an electrolyzer is at the, at the high Wikipedia level? Uh, at the high, with the Wikipedia level. <laughs> Uh, so an electrolyzer, um, basically takes water. There are a couple of types of electrolyzers, but let's just say it takes water and electricity, um, as the feedstocks, the electricity splits the water molecule into its component parts, which are hydrogen and oxygen. And the hydrogen is captured and then compressed, um, into storage tanks and ultimately into vehicles and the hydrogen, I mean, I'm sorry, the oxygen can be used. Um, also to be bottled as a product or released into the atmosphere as what a tree. And thinking about utilizing that hydrogen as a product, whether for commercial or industrial scale issues, um, I think focusing in on hydrogen, it's, it's specific chemical makeup. You, you mentioned an interesting fact to us in a previous discussion about something that wouldn't think of hydrogen as, compo as a, compared to natural gas in terms of odorizing for uh, industrial and, and uh, consumer use. So could you touch on that a little bit? Um, so hydrogen um, as compared to natural gas. So I mean, the, yeah, the ability to odorize it. Oh, the ability to odorize it. Yeah. Well, um, so yeah, if you want to put um, hydrogen in the pipeline, I mean, it, there was in England, I think um, one of the first pipelines was a hydrogen rich syngas that was used to run lights and stoves um, in the 1800s, I want to say it was, uh, if my memory serves. But, uh, but yeah, if you want to run in a large industrial pipeline with hydrogen, the odorization of it is, is tricky because hydrogen is so light um, and, and it has such a high dis diffusivity that when it's released, um, it leaves the odorant behind. So the hydrogen is gone, but whatever you injected in it to make it smell, um, is left, is left where, uh, where it was. So you, yeah, it's, you can't, you can't odorize hydrogen. Um, somebody will figure out a way to do it someday, I hope. Um, but, but not yet. I think so that, let me if you, oh, go ahead, quick, just kind of following up on that as a limiting factor, perhaps in the present. Um, and you talked about municipalities, right. And their, their different goals, or in some cases, uh, requirements to transition to low carbon or zero carbon or net zero carbon future. Are there any common uh, other common characteristics that you or Ivis is seeing where hydrogen projects are are taking off? Either because municipalities or or other potential um, hydrogen customers, um, there are certain efficiencies or cost savings or or what have you, or there are those limitations where it doesn't make sense to use the hydrogen. Um, in one area, one location, or for a particular end use, um, but then that drives where there are opportunities to leverage and, and expand hydrogen production in other areas. So, um, okay, so it's, that's kind of a uh, multi-level question. Yes, definitely, very much um, so. <laughs> but, it, but that's good. So in some cases, it makes sense to, you're saying like what, what industries are, are, are seeing a growth. Yes. And I would definitely say the composites. Um, when I say composites, I mean the tanks. So, you know, we all are familiar with steel tanks. They've been around, you know, or, you know, well chops and, 
um, in tube trailers, you drive past them on the road. Um, some of those tanks have, you know, they were built in the, in the 1912 or 1920s, right? They're still in use today. Um, but they're heavy and they don't hold as high of a pressure. So therefore the usable payload of those steel vessels is not as great as we would like to see. So, um, when you talk about, um, how do you transport hydrogen? There's, you can move it as gas. Um, you can move it as a liquid. The well, liquefaction is energy intensive. It's, you know, you have to chill that hydrogen a lot colder than liquid nitrogen. People think of cryogenic fluid as liquid nitrogen. Well, no, no, no. You got to go a whole lot colder, um, with hydrogen, um, versus like to, to liquefy it. Um, but it's certainly a valuable um, pathway to transport it. But what we're seeing now is a huge growth in um, in the the getting increasing the payload of each run of a trailer, let's say, and that's the desire because it minimizes the labor cost and it minimizes that transport cost of you know uh, what which is today a diesel uh, tractor right that's driving it down the road. Um, so there's a lot of effort. And um, in working with um, you know the government to get permitting for higher pressure tanks, and these tanks are typically what we call a type three or a type four. A uh, type three tank would be something with a metal liner, aluminum liner that's wrapped with carbon fiber. Um, and type four tanks are basically all all mm -hmm. um, composite material, so polypropylene liner again with carbon fiber wrap. The higher the pressure you need, the more carbon fiber needs to go to keep everything contained, but, uh, the higher pressure transports, um, they can increase the payload delivered to a site. Um, and also, you know, that they basically, when a trailer then goes back to be refueled, um, you want that, that delivered payload to be as great as possible, um, to minimize the cost of the molecule that you're using. So I would say in terms of what, yeah, what, what, um, sectors are, are seeing a lot of focus, definitely in the transport side of things today. And, and I assume kind of built into that is in part um, cost-driven demand, right, to your point, but then also, a, I don't want to say a supply demand, but trying to figure out ways in which uh, you can efficiently move, transport, distribute larger quantities of hydrogen compared to I, I don't know what the timeline is, but, but suffice to say several years ago. Yeah. So, you know, and there's, so there's the, there's the economics, which should always, in my opinion, should always drive industry. And then there are government mandates that uh, say thou must do this by this date. Um, and then there's some money made available, um, but that gets things rolling, but it doesn't, it won't sustain an industry. Really the economics are what have to sustain an industry. Um, but that being said, the government mandates are good um, because getting that ball rolling is a, is one of the challenges the industry has faced for the last 20 years is I'd love to have a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle that emits nothing but water. Um, I would love to um, drive that around my town, take the kids to soccer practice, but there's no hydrogen fueling station nearby. And the hydrogen fueling station say, okay, well, the government told me, paid for me to build one but I don't have enough vehicles coming in to cover the cost of maintenance. So after the two year period of running it, um, it doesn't sustain itself. So the station shuts down or gets mocked off. So that's where government plays a key role there, right? Is to um, inject funding um, and, and hopefully they're, you know, learning the right ways to inject funding to kind of really help build that infrastructure. And that that might lead us to the next next kind of topic that I'll I'll have Daniel take is kind of where are we looking in the future, not only with market driven demands and needs, but also government. So, Daniel, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, no, I I think that's a a perfect segue and and kind of Wes already alluded to this, but but built it up very well to talk about future growth and projections. Right there's there's a mix of kind of three different factors I think going on um, for for future use and scale up of of hydrogen. Um, the first is, you know, significant projections, estimates, and mandates in some cases 
um, both at the country level and then um, there on down at the state or local level and then company specific levels for hydrogen growth, right? We talked a little bit about uh, future projections globally of 12 to 13% um, energy consumption driven by hydrogen fuel. That then translates for um, large energy companies alone into saying, okay, by 2050, we think um, energy consumption or energy supply, energy transported, um, compared to where we are right now on a volumetric basis, might be filled anywhere from three to eight percent um, by hydrogen or hydrogen fuel, however they're defining um, those products. Um, moreover, right, we're seeing a big push for green hydrogen in particular because of the development and and robust robust demand for renewable projects, and therefore corresponding uh, energy prices coming down for renewables in the wind and solar space in partic particular, um, therefore making green energy um, more cost competitive um, and um, therefore incentivizing further development and cost savings with electrolyzers as well and increased efficiency um, based on improvements within uh, the technology for, for each. Um, and then Overall demand, overall projections, and and what have you, um, as Wes alluded to, at least starts to create the market for for hydrogen, and therefore attract capital, um, where it's very much needed in a capital intensive industry. If we're really talking about large scale um, use of of hydrogen, um, you know, um, depending on whether it is with uh, fuel cells or other uses that that we've already talked about. Um, but notwithstanding of, of those three different components and the mix and, and all the projections going forward, we have yet to see, and, and only in limited circumstances, um, green hydrogen project, projects that have been successfully uh, been brought to market. A lot of them have been announced. A lot of them are on paper. A lot of them are, are being built as we speak. Um, but in, in limited circumstances, we have yet to see um, very large scale hydrogen production projects that are built and in operation um, outside of current uses within the manufacturing and industrial industry. I'm going to, I'm going to have to just cut you off there, Dan. Um, so we installed a hydrogen refueling station uh, for buses for the Champaign-Urbana uh, transit district, which is the largest um, hydrogen uh, solar powered hydrogen fueling station. Um, I, maybe in the world, but certainly in the country. Uh, it's got an electrolyzer, a solar array, an electrolyzer to produce that hydrogen, 500 kilograms a day um, to fuel buses. And they're, they're currently up and running today. So it's, you know, it's working, um, but I think it's important to understand the meaning of the word large scale. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, I think that that's where uh, I certainly have gotten hung up over the years. You know, as I said, my background is as a systems engineer, um, you know, uh, simple fuel, what we talked about in the beginning is this hydrogen station in a box that we envision for urban centers that can be, you know, dropped right next to a building in an alleyway. And we have one in Somerville Nads at Greentown Labs. Um, that is actually what I used to refuel my Hyundai Nixo, um, that I, I stole from our CEO. Um, but, um, but that's 20 kilograms or that unit is 10 kilograms a day or current simple fuels produce 20 kilograms a day. But I'm also talking to people about um, what are we going to do with 35,000 kilograms per day? Um, you know, when, you know, up in Canada on the pipeline, when their demand is, is slow from the refineries, we're going to need to compress that into trailers or, you know, what do I do with it? Do I liquefy it? So, so you know, 20 kilograms a day here, 500 kilogram a day, you know, solar station um, you know, outside Chicago, and then 35 tons a day you know, um, up in, uh, our Northern neighbors. So, um, it, it's tough for me when, you know, large scale, I think when you're talking about large scale, we're talking about the planet, it's more like that, right? 35 tons a day. And, and that's really, you know, a, a good size hydrogen plant that we talk about today, it is a five ton or a 10 ton a day. And so when I say tons, I mean, metric tons, you know, thousand kilograms, right? So. Um, and a good part of those plans, they're on pipelines that are providing that hydrogen. 
at a, at a different quality than the, than the vehicles need, by the way, but they provide that hydrogen to the refineries. Um, so are other ways that we can tap into that infrastructure to, um, increase the production capacities of what already exists. Um, and then, you know, uh, purify it up a little bit and put in nodes that can support over the road tractors. And that's something that I was going to get to, um, in a little bit more detail, but I'll wait to talk about what vehicles are the best, the best, uh, you know, have the best use case for hydrogen, but, um. I Sorry to cut you off, Dan. Yeah. No, I think it leads I, in. Yeah, it leads into maybe Daniel. If you could tell us a little bit about hydrogen hubs and and the government yeah, programs. No, for that. exactly. And, and and they're all great points, right? If we're talking about uh, on the scale of several thousand tons on a daily basis, um, as Wes already said, you know that in most scenarios requires additional funding and significant funding. And so we've seen in the U.S. as an example. Um, in the last couple of years, real big pushes from the federal government um, to help develop not just supply side and production for hydrogen, but also um, demand as well. Um, the hydrogen hubs or H2 hubs, right, um, was set out um, from the Infrastructure Act a couple of years ago, um, just by way of background that is designed to help create or select six to 10, I believe is the range, regional clean hydrogen hubs, um, providing funding of, of somewhere around $7 billion. Um, and so you've seen different states, different utilities, different um, companies all come together in different regions of the United mm -hmm. States and submit these bids for their proposed hub, um, most of which are now pending before the federal government um, and will be awarded in in months and years to come. But then on the on the supply side, we also saw very recently the U.S. announced that it will put forth one one billion dollars in funding to help drive supply, so that those hubs have reassurance and and the companies making these investments have some sort of reassurance that there will be some demand on the other end um, mm -hmm. when these projects are built. Um, but it, it it it's all fascinating, right? There, needless to say, there will be significant growth within the hydrogen space. But as Wes already pointed out, you know, um, whether or not it takes hold on such massive scales is largely dependent on the economics um, at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm I'm so happy to hear that. You know, people talking about both sides. I mean, it's clear. Okay, so human beings, we can learn, right? Well, um, that if you, you, you put in the supply, but you need the demand to, to fund that because once the project is done, it'll shrivel up. Um, so you really need to come at this problem with the two pronged approach. You need to support the, the demand side, um, you know, whatever those vehicles are going to be, whether they're buses, passenger cars, um, class eight trackers, um, which I mean, are people think of a tractor trailer, right? That's a, a really strong case for um, for going, you know, carbon zero. Um, you know, there's a, uh, everything that you know we eat is delivered to the store by a truck, and um, you know that's one of the most demanding uh, cases. I mean, those tractors are very expensive, and uh, to have them sitting um, charging up is problematic. Um, but also, just something to consider. Um, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing that is diesel fuel, um, or CNG, even, uh, you think about these carbon fuels, we don't live with them because, um, of a whoops. It was, uh, it was really, you know, it became the staple of our life because of the, the amazing energy density that's there. And when you do hold a gasoline pump in your hand and you can put and, you know, I mean, I have about 550 mile range in my car. When you, I hold that and I'm filling my car in seven minutes or six minutes, I'm holding a megawatt, right? So when you think about what are we going to do if we're, we're going to say, we're going to, we're going to turn every car into a battery electric car. Well, our, I mean, so what, and think about it, what has to happen there? Think about how much energy comes into the country, either out of our ground or through refineries, but comes into our daily life through something other than the grid. And it's, it's mind blowing how much energy that is. So um, shifting the energy pathways to something that's carbon zero 
carbon negative even. Um, it's great, and, you know, certainly support that. That's why I got into this field 25 years ago, Jesus. Um, but, um, yeah, how we do that um, is, is important to consider. And, you know, are we going to be building, you know, a, uh, a megawatt power plant for every uh, hydrogen uh, or every uh, electric charging station? Um, well, maybe. Um, are we going to convert some of that usage to hydrogen fuel? Certainly. Is it going to be all of the above? Yes, it will. Um, so how can we do that? Um, it's going to take, it's going to take every energy existing energy path, because again, we're on this little marble floating in space. We only have a few options of where we get our energy from, right? We pull it out of the ground, we get it from the sun, we get it from the wind, uh, we get it from tidal or water falling down a uh, waterfall. Um, you know, those are the, that's basically what we get. So, uh, sorry, I didn't, you know, mean to stand on a soapbox there, but yeah, we have to think about it in a global perspective, um, to really drive to a solution, I think. And I'll, I'll mention a couple more just from a, I guess, a, a predominantly a, a utility, um, highly regulated part of the energy industry perspective. Um, in terms of future projections and and how you get there, or perhaps some obstacles along the way that I think a lot of companies are going to be wrestling with. Number one, you know, in such a capital intensive uh, industry, if we're really talking about scaling up, that we're transporting massive amounts of hydrogen, um, perhaps leveraging you know existing infrastructure, whether it's storage or it's natural gas pipelines, for instance, um, there really needs to be some sort of cost certainty you know, to give companies assurance, you know, that what they are doing has a decent chance of, of success or profitability. Um, as of right now, you know, um, by and large, the, the hydrogen industry is based off of commercial terms, arm length negotiations, et cetera. And maybe that continues. Um, maybe it's unlike natural gas pipelines um, where the economics are driven by cost base regulations. Um, but if if it is going to go to a, a regulatory scheme, then there needs to be some certainty as to, you know, if you're putting energy into existing infrastructure that is regulated um, from a cost-based perspective, who pays for those costs um, for, for upgrading any systems or, or changes that occur? And then um, even broader than that, you know, if you're getting into this space, um, I think there needs to be some certainty with return in terms of the regulatory regime that may or may not apply. Um, there, there's um, extensive debate again, long term down the road, if hydrogen is transported in massive amounts um, or distributed in massive amounts in existing infrastructure. You know, who regulates that infrastructure? Um, should it be a light-handed approach? Um, should it just be focused on safety? Should it be a similar approach to what we see in the utility industry for natural gas pipelines? You know, just knowing those answers um, can play a huge uh, role on whether or not you know companies are looking to actually invest and design and then put into practice um, you know transportation, distribution, storage, all the things that. You know, it seems there's a lot of assumptions going to 2040, 2045, 2050 that will occur, but um, nothing designed yet and and nothing final yet because we don't see what that regulatory scheme looks like. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy that we're having this conversation. I'm glad people are having this conversation. Uh, what seems to me to be, I want to say, fine ladies. Um, you know, um, it's well, certainly you, you talked about safety and who regulates will certainly... Um, yes, safety should be regulated, number one, because the biggest uh, adversary to the hydrogen industry, I think, today is the concept around it being unsafe, which is couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, we talked about hydrogen being such a small and diffusive molecule. It's very light. You know, it goes up. It's very buoyant. It goes up and diffuses outward very quickly. So if there is a release of hydrogen, um, you know, it's gone basically. So, um, you know, the odor in, we're used to an odor in the natural gas or pro propane, but I would argue hydrogen doesn't need it. I mean, if it's released in a very confined space, is it explosive? Yes, it's a combustible gas. 
Um, but in terms of how we use our fuels every day, um, you know, a switch to hydrogen is going to be an improvement in safety. So, but you do also have to be very uh, cognizant of the material of the properties of this gas. It's, it's not like natural gas, it's not like nitrogen. It has a lot of, of its, it has a lot of its own properties that are different from other gases. And one of the things that I want to make sure folks are aware of is material compatibility. So people say for hydrogen, just use stainless steel. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, sort of. But if you were to take your dinner fork, which is a 17 or 18 series stainless steel and put it inside a hydrogen balloon, let's say, uh, let it sit there for you know a week. You take that dinner fork and drop it on a tile floor, it's going to shatter. So um, most people don't have their dinner forks made out of 316 ounce stainless steel. That would handle the hydrogen just fine. Um, so there, we have to consider, we have existing infrastructure. Um, yes, hydrogen can be used as a percentage of that. Uh, you can inject it into pipelines as a percentage. Um, if it's all hydrogen, and, and what that percentage is will dictate how long materials that are currently in use in that infrastructure will last. So does all that, you know, you have a pipeline that's uh, that's steel, let's say, and hydrogen is happy to uh, to run inside steel pipelines. But there's the there are the valves and the equipment uh, for handling that, you know, compressors and, you know, there's a lot of equipment and sensors around this infrastructure. And each little piece that's in there has to be evaluated for its compatibility with hydrogen gas to make sure that if you have a 5,000 PSI pipeline that you're used to running a natural gas and now you have it running 50% hydrogen, that that one little valve that's there isn't going to riddle and, then, and blow off, right? And cause um, what we like to what cause a thermal event, which would be um, not, not good for the industry. So, you know, the, the, so what I'm happy to hear who regulates it. Focus on safety is key, right? Um, across, you know, this, this industry. And I think that's why I feel so confident about saying hydrogen is a safe fuel because all of the folks who have been involved in the hydrogen industry and the development up to today, at least all of the ones that I know, and I know folks in the industrial gas world and the vehicle world, um, everybody's really focused on safety and, and all of the codes and standards that are developed not only in the U.S., but also, um, you know, worldwide um, are so really encompassing. They're, they're far reaching um, as, to, as to how hydrogen is used and making sure that it's used safely. So off the soapbox again, that was the second soapbox I was on today. Sorry. Well, I, I think you're definitely hitting a lot of the concerns, considerations of real world practical uh, applications, as well as potential roadblocks. Um, I think with all of that in mind, I think pointing out, you know, some of those solutions are already in the process of being solved and some will be found in the, in, you know, we'll find the answers to the problems in the future. As the resident IP lawyer and patent litigator on the panel, I think I'll I'll put my two cents in on that point that companies like Wes's, Ivis are creating valuable intellectual property and trade secrets every day out in the field. And what we see from a historical perspective is that um, what we call the patent wars, uh, which have happened in the past in history, may repeat in this new emerging field of the hydrogen industry kind of takeover. And what I say, the, the patent wars in the past, think of all the major uh, advances. Electric lighting, there's famous cases between Edison and Westinghouse. Air travel, I think of between the Wright brothers and Curtis airplanes. Telephone, Alexander Graham Bell was involved in litigation. And even up to present day of the smartphone wars between Apple and Samsung, and even more recently, the EV battery uh, wars and trade secret cases in which uh, a very uh, influential case in the news between LG Chem and SK Innovation of uh, settlements over a billion dollars approaching $2 billion. So we want to keep our eyes on this and how IP will not only create value, but uh, be used by companies as they're trying to either affect or protect their market share as, as things start to evolve and consolidate as we historically will see those trends in the hydrogen industry but that's I, yeah. I, want to just, I just want to say you couldn't be further you couldn't be more correct there um it's 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 
uh, for everybody that's in the hydrogen space, um, everybody is really, you know, what drives the value is what they're uh, of the valuation of the organization is their IP portfolio for sure. Um, and there will be battles over it. Um, you know, somebody in one part of the world might develop something very similar. Um, and then, uh, yeah, who did it first sort of thing, but yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly happening just because. We're, we're friends now. We play nice in the sandbox. Most of the folks in the hot reading space today um, doesn't mean that there's not going to be these battles coming in the future. Um, it's certainly, it's certainly, it's an inevitability really. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll also add uh, within the IP space um, that we still might not know what that breakthrough technology even looks like, right? Because it might be something on the production side, because there's so much on the production side that we're focused on now. But as Wes already alluded to, it might be on some of the practical solutions, right, for getting large amounts of hydrogen to market or helping create or perhaps support market demand, um, different uses for hydrogen on the demand side that have not yet matured or even really taken off or developed. Um, for large end uses, the way that various companies and um, local and state governments and and countries on the whole are projecting, you know, twenty years down the road. Yeah, we we could look to the photo photovoltaic industry uh, to take some notes from there. Um, you know, there were great uh, strides in the efficiency improvements and you know cost of manufacture that were happening. Um, the efficiency of panels now are pretty, I mean, from what I've seen, are kind of leveling off. Um, I think, you know, hydrogen generation has been done for, you know, a couple hundred years, of, you know, heavily in, in for in industry for at least a hundred years. Um, yeah, we're seeing improvements in that process now that there's a focus on the need for more of it. Um, yeah, I think that that's, a, that's an area to keep an eye on for sure is the efficiency of hydrogen production. But keep in mind, though, um, Nobody's been wanting to spend more energy than necessary, and we still have to live in a world where thermodynamics is still a law, not just a theory. So, um, you know, um, I, I think when we look at, you know, what are the emerging segments of technical advantage, uh, the, the handling of that hydrogen after it's produced is, um, is, I think, a great point, Dan. I think that that's something that's, uh, that's going to be a, an area to focus on. Well, with that, I think, Daniel, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you for kind of your wrap up and takeaways of where you see the hydrogen industry today. Yeah, it, it it's all very exciting, right? And as I already mentioned, it's all but certain given the injection and enthusiasm, injection of funds, enthusiasm to, to grow, develop um, technol technology breakthroughs uh, within the energy space that we're gonna see an uptick, certainly on the production side and then coupled on some level on the demand uh, side as well. Um, but whether or not this, this growth is sustained in, you know, and again, here's that keyword, Wes, you know, very large scale, um, on a large scale basis and matches those, those projections for whatever it is in, in 2035, 2030 and, and beyond, um, TBD. Um, but what what strikes me as fascinating and perhaps the the topic of further discussion in a in a follow-up podcast, if we can again borrow on Wes's time, are some of the more practical um considerations um that I think a lot of companies need to think about. Um, just mentioning a couple that that Wes alluded to includes um public outreach and education. Um, safety concerns or perhaps misconceptions with regard to safety, and then operation and maintenance, given that hydrogen in some ways is similar to other, uh, not just fossil fuels, but fuels that that we have uh, worked with for, for decades and, and are very much used to, but in other ways is very, very different. Um, so seeing how that plays out, not just in a couple of years, not just when the, the funds have kind of reach their maximum, um, but in the long term is kind of what fascinates me. Well, that's great. And I think uh, it, there's a lot of topics there for the future for us to discuss and explore together. But 
I think with that, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank you, Daniel, and I want to thank you, Wes, especially. And I want to thank all the listeners for taking the time with us today. Uh, Wes, I don't know if you want to leave us with any parting uh, pearls of wisdom. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I shouldn't, um, uh, because I don't have them. I mean, I'm, I'm in the midst of this, and I think um, the growth is in the hydrogen space is coming. I've seen it over the last 25 years. Um, and it's, it's exciting to be a part of it. Um, but you know, even on a, a small scale, um, the community outreach is important for sure, Dan, I think. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's great that less and less when I tell people I work in hydrogen, um, it used to be every single person would say, like the Hindenburg and say, uh, yeah, I like that only without the rocket fuel paint on the outside. Um, but yeah, so I don't get that too much anymore, which is great. Um, so yeah, if you guys need some more of my time to talk about details, um, you know, use cases and 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 uh, in what markets I think might might grow in the hydrogen space, I'm happy to contribute. So, but thanks for having me. This has been fun. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Wes. 